So good morning and welcome. It's uh, wonderful to have you here so bright and early um, on a Saturday morning. I'm sure more people will be uh, rolling out of bed later on this morning and will join us. So we, you really, those people who are here this bright and early, they get special brownie points. So thank you all very much for being here. This has been an incredibly busy few weeks here at the GSD and it was really wonderful to um, see the, the discussion uh, last night that got us started for the beginning of uh, this conference. And I really want to take this opportunity to not only welcome you, but really to welcome all of our visitors from, uh, from Barcelona who have made the trip, who are going to speak to us. Really, thank you for your support. and. Uh, Thank you for your collaboration for this really wonderful exhibition. It looks, uh, it looks beautiful. We are all going to study it in more and more uh, detail, but it's a special privilege for us to, um, to have you here. I also, of course, want to thank the speakers um, uh, who are not necessarily connected with Barcelona for also being here and for agreeing to make the presentation. Of course, my main, my main point of gratitude goes to uh, Joan Busquet. Professor Joan Busquet, as you know, has been single-handedly so focused on the large questions of urbanization and specifically also making a special study of uh, Barcelona. And I'm really grateful to you, Joan, for uh, everything you've done and to Professor Diane Davis for her leadership and for the discussions uh, yesterday. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's basically a, a kind of big team approach that has got us here uh, so far. Um, <clears throat> Barcelona, for uh, many of us, uh, holds a special place. Um, I feel fortunate to have actually spent quite a bit of time there myself over the years, being involved in various initiatives. I have very fond memories of being a little bit involved in this metropolis program at the university with, uh, with um, the team that were there, with Ignacio Sola Morales, uh, with Javier Costa, and then also with Edward Brew and others on the La Scala program. Uh, so I feel, in a way, very engaged, very connected with the city, and I feel that uh, uh, over the years, many of us have tried to uh, to learn as much as possible uh, from the city. Yesterday, we heard from uh, Juan really about the history of the city and the role of uh, Cerda. Um, I think it's also obviously very inspiring when we look at the more recent past, how the city, inspired by this tradition, has also made enormous contributions to the more sort of contemporary development of the city of Barcelona. Um, under different mayors and uh, with the support and the very systematic involvement of specific architects who really had important political positions within the administration of the government in uh, Barcelona. Obviously, Oriel Bohigas and others have been very important for this particular transformation, and this is something that still goes on to this day. Yesterday, one of the issues that um, came up, and it really is probably one of the key um, questions of this conference, is really about lessons learned. What can we learn from the case of somewhere like Barcelona? And it seems that, uh, obviously, if we look at that particular history, there is an enormous amount that we can learn. And being in the context of a, of a school of design, this actually makes these questions even more more pertinent, but in a way, a sort of complementary question related to what lessons can we learn, for me, are also what lessons are we prevented from learning from Barcelona? Uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a facetious sense, but I think often you face certain situations where you have incredible commitment and you have incredible desires, but actually there are certain structural conditions that prevent the possibility of implementing the things that one has learned. And I think in the context of how, for example, we operate, 
uh, in connection to questions of urbanization in the United States, one of the key discussions would be the possibility, in a way, of uh, discussing uh, the question of lessons and what the applicability of these lessons might be, for example, to the US con context and the difficulties, the challenges, and the opportunities of realizing those, um, those kinds of um, potentials. In the discussion, um, my colleague, uh, Professor Davis, uh, at the end, um, feeling that there wasn't anyone who was speaking for planning, even though she's the one who speaks all the time for planning, uh, <clears throat> asked the question, well, what about planning and the people? Um, as if the people weren't there in the plans of Barcelona, in the buildings that were built by the planners, the architects of the city. And for me, this is, this is a very important uh, question. I think there are two ways, in some ways, to respond to this question. One is that the political structure of a city like Barcelona is already one where the political is deeply engaged with the realities of the individuals, the people, and the people's will in terms of the shaping of the city. So therefore, there is, in a way, a reciprocal relationship between the architectural project, the urban realization, and the participation of uh, the citizens themselves. And it is, it is for them that housing projects are constructed, boulevards are made, parks are created, hospitals are built, schools are built, and so on. And therefore, this interrelationship between the political, the people, and the project of, uh, of the city, the city as an artifact, is something that I think is very important for us to realize. The other side of what about planning and the people is about planning where in the in United States when we speak of planning, we often speak of what are the planning regulations. So planning is invariably, even though there are exceptions and we will hear about some of those exceptions today, planning is linked to regulatory uh, instruments rather than what I would call emancipatory instruments. Emancipatory instruments are those instruments, like the case of Barcelona, that actually provide the possibility of a certain level of freedom, of possibilities, of, um, of a different kind of life, a better life for the citizens. Um, and therefore, we have to ask ourselves the question of how do we also move from this concept of the policies which tend to be much more focused on regulation to the investigation of the interrelationship between regulatory frameworks and spatial uh, visionary, if you like, or emancipatory perhaps is a, is a, is a better word, uh, frameworks for planning. This indeed, I think, is one of the main questions of the conference because of the fact that we also at the GSD um, have um, another connection, in a way, with Barcelona and with Spain, where uh, one of my predecessors, uh, José Luis Cert, uh, was, in fact, the architect, the urbanist, who started the urban design program here at the GSD almost 60 years ago. And we were the very first urban design program in the United States. And at that time, when urban design was established, urban design mm, was really seen as a mode of practice that existed in between the other disciplines, namely architecture, landscape architecture, and planning. Therefore, it was somehow the mechanism by which we negotiated the interrelationship of the multiple disciplines to the formation of the city itself. Today, for example, uh, we now have um, a department called the Department of Urban Planning and Design, Urban Planning and Urban Design, where now the emphasis is more on the interrelationship between planning and urban design, and of course still on the connections between 
architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design. But the structure of the way in which things are organized is different than the way that it was organized under Jose Luis said. Perhaps it was more, mm, more experimental in that, in that idea of urban design existing as something that's between the disciplines rather than being more located within a particular kind of context. But what I think is, is very uh, important is that this discussion of Barcelona, on the one hand, relates to the discussion of urbanization more broadly, but also relates to the question of the future of pedagogy and research within the academy and how can institutions like the GSD actually prepare future designers, people who deal with the city, and therefore we are asking of you to help us in some way in the context of your discussions to also bear in mind that we are also asking the question of what is urban design today? If CERT, with his connections to Barcelona, was thinking that urban design was this interrelationship between architecture and the city, today we have a situation where I think urban design transcends that model as the singular model of what urban design is. I believe today we cannot only speak of urban design as the architecture of the city, but as a mode of practice that is much more complex in terms of how it engages with planning, with infrastructure, with the political, with the architectural, with questions of nature, and all of those things. Therefore, it's, it would be really fantastic to also try to, uh, wherever possible, insert this question, at least for our sake, and to see where we might actually uh, go uh, from Barcelona, if you like, to both the future of cities, but also the future of um, urban design. So I'm looking forward to all the presentations and to um, get us going. Um, I'd like you to welcome Professor Diane Davis, who will introduce the speakers and uh, set the day in motion. Thank you very much. Well, as you saw, we did a little bit of a switch, ar switch around of the program, just in part because there, we're going to have more substantive conversations put on the table by both Ramon and Juan. So, um, and, and now I'm regretting that we switched things around because it's very hard to follow my dean because he said everything that I wanted to say about our larger conversation. But, so I'm going to be very brief, and you heard a lot from me yesterday already. But I do want to kind of situate the day in the context of two conversations. One that um, one which is that was started yesterday afternoon with the panel, um, and thinking about the claim that uh, or or Carles's comment that all the disciplines are claiming the city, but also a longer conversation that we've ha been having in the urban planning and design program, and I've been having with Juan over the last year about this exhibition. So I just want people to realize that it's been, well, probably over a year since we've talked in our department about the importance of being able to have an event, not just the wonderful exhibition that Juan has um, curated with all of your help, but an, a conference, an event where we could talk a little more about the future possibilities, the way that we're moving as a department, following what Moisen said, about the conversation between planning and design. So we, are, we have great expectations about this today's conference with respect to kind of pulling out new ways of thinking for the field of urban design and its relationship to the other design disciplines. And that has to do with thinking about possibly new methods, um, new practices, new analytical framings, um, maybe even thinking in what Moisen said, well, it's obvious the people are in the buildings, but maybe that's not the only way that we want to understand the relationship between the built environment and the, shall we say, social environment. I think there are questions about scale. What are the scalar entry points that urban design needs to be thinking about? Um, and I know we'll be hearing more about that today because the title, we're talking about the metropolis, where we're talking about multiple scales. Is urban design trying to work into, um, trying to create methods and frameworks and ideas for connecting scales 
in ways that maybe haven't always been on the front burner of the urban design as a profession. And I think that um, we'll hear more about some of these new issues for the future from Marion Weiss, but also in the rest of the conference, I'm hoping that in the presentations, as well as in the Q&A with the audience, that we can use today as an opportunity to be expansive and creative about where the field of urban design is going. I guess I would, the last thing that, and I think that is ultimately what we were ending up with yesterday, not just that a lot of disciplines are claiming the city. So if they are, what is the special added value of what we're doing uh, or what urban design is doing and the connectivity between architecture, landscape architecture, as well as planning? I guess the last thing that I would end um, with is I do think in some senses it raises the open question, which we won't resolve today, of like what is the city? If we start with the claim that the uh, all the disciplines are claiming the city, I think then we really have to ask, how do we conceptually understand the city? How is it produced? And I'm not just talking about territorial boundaries between the city and its hinterland or the countryside, but really what is the experience of urbanism that's captured in, in the city? And that does pull us back to Barcelona because if people are lo always looking for models of the type of urbanism that they will, the quotidian urbanism they want to experience, coming back to Barcelona as their model. So hopefully there'll be some back and forth understanding, not just of how that urban, urbanism was created today, but how that should help us think about what we are aspiring to with respect to the urban experience and urbanism, and what we can do as professionals to ensure that we can create more spaces like those that are, have been produced in Barcelona. So with that, I'd also want to echo our deans, welcome to everybody, people who came from so far, people who are here early in the morning. Um, and one more special thanks to Juan for being the leader of the conversation about Barcelona and helping us with the conference. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day. Thanks. Good morning to all. Dear Dean, Joan, I would like to thank uh, you for your invitation to participate uh, in this conference. I will now uh, proceed to talk about the Barcelona metropolitan area, which is the public body that I am in charge of. This the Okay. Thank you. The, where is the metropolitan area? All people now, <laughs> or where is? But is in the in the south of Europe, in the in the coast, the Mediterranean coast. And this is a, a question that uh, the character of the city is a, a question, an important question. No? It's a, the metropolitan area. The 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 public body is comprised of 36 municipalities with more than 3 million people in, in an area of 636 uh, square kilometers. No? It's a, 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 continuity, a urban continuity of a, of a city. No? Our institution. Uh, is a, a DMB is a public body. It's created in uh, 2010, and however, it has a long-lasting history. It's a new uh, organization, but uh, uh, all history. The competencies is uh, for ever three years. This area has managed jointly its competencies of water cycle uh, services, uh, wa uh, waste, mobility and urban planning, and others, uh, social and uh, economic uh, policies. The budget, the budget of the uh, AMB group is a uh, is uh, the global budget of the uh, AMB group is 1,005. 107 million euros, and uh, the, 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 the best part is the, 
the, is the 52% is for a, a metropolitan transport company. Is the, the, in the budget is the, the, the big part of the, of the economy. The uh, second is the la, uh, the is the, uh, the the owner institution. No, is the the AMB is more than uh, 40 percent, and the other is uh, 57 million euros is assigned uh, to other metropolitan com uh, companies uh, devoted to housing, taxi services, or infor uh, information services. Is a uh, as territory. As territory is concerned, uh, we have powers in urban planning, <coughs> infrastructures, public spaces, and housing. In a spatial, in a spatial and urban planning, we work in projects at different scales, regional, metropolitan, and local. And uh, at uh, this point, I would, uh, I would like to highlight the driving process of the urban master uh, plan. Uh, after uh, four years of validity of the P uh, PGM, is the Metropolitan General Plan, we have started with the, the support of the Professor Busquets, the preliminary drafting uh, was in order uh, to complete the P PDU, is the Uyurba Master Plan in the, in the Barcelona Metropolitan Area, between uh, two years and, uh, and two's progress in the path of sustainable growth and social and ter uh, territorial equity. And infrastructure uh, matters. We manage green infrastructures, infrastructures, mobility, and the facilities that guaranteed metropolitan metabolism and resilience. The green infrastructure is a, a part of the, the wars of the metropolitan area. It's very important that with more than 52% of non-occupied land, environmental values of forests, wet areas, beaches and parks have introduced balancing elements for the metropolitan regions, such and leisure of our health. This is a... a, a Differential, uh, uh, different, and uh, the other uh, metropolitan areas, no, is the the balance uh, between occupied and non-occupied uh, uh, territory. No? In the projects uh, and, and works, no, is a, a is a, a, a government uh, for the action, no, and the the investing in public spaces uh, is a means to improve social cohesion and buildings a better a, 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 and building a better living and better for metropolitan citizens. The AMB promotes projects and works both uh, large scale in the natural park of Coixerola, uh, environment rest uh, restoration of, of rivers or uh, with a specific uh, a specific um, Emphasis on social issues. Beaches and seafront promenades uh, built, uh, urban integration of ma uh, major roads, infrastructures, etc. And also on a small scale, town scale projects, uh, urban transformation projects, etc. Also, uh, we are in charge of uh, 45 uh, uh, urban parks scattered uh, all over uh, the metropolitan area, totaling more than uh, 250 hectares. These there are historical parks and new parks. Also in uh, managing the, the beaches, no? the beaches is another uh, element of character of the metropolitan area of Barcelona with a uh, 40, 40 kilometers uh, long uh, of beaches are one of the main infrastructures of, uh, of the metropolis. More than uh, 10 million people use the beaches all the year. In housing, the AMB promotes housing contract constructions under different tenure 
conditions in order to fac uh, facilitate the right to access to the housing, either uh, purchase or rental, no? It's a different models of tenure. Also, besides, is launched in the last four years different uh, refurbishing programs with more than uh, 40, 40 million euros in subsides. Is another the the uh, city build it and the new city, no? Is the both. And environment, another of these competence that uh, AMB has considered concerns the water cycle, the base treatment, and the sustainability, and the sustainability. And the, uh, and the water cycle, the Metropolitan Administration uh, managed the comp comprehensive uh, water cycle from water catchment and purification going through distribution and consumption and ending up either in sewage uh, treatment before puring, uh, puring it back to environment without, demising it. Or in re regenerate uh, process to, re to reuse is for not potable water uses. In the waste treatment plants, the treatment of waste in the metropolitan area of Barcelona is based on minimization, established through a network of eco parks in permanent upgrading and energy recovery plan. And mobility and transport, another of competencies. People living in this uh, compact and interconnected metropolitan area carry, uh, carry out 10 million traps a day. And means of transport, the priority is implemented through the Metropolitan Urban Mobility Plan that considers mobility comprehensively in different aspects. Uh, is the public transport in the metropolitan area management of 210 bus lines and uh, 11 uh, metro lines. Is the system of, or the basically the the system of uh, public transport. Also, management metropolitan taxis and uh, other uh, transport systems. Is for example the aerobus is for uh, the transport to to with bus to the airport or the touristic bus. No, is for uh, to, uh, for the uh, foreigners no? that visited Barcelona. Also, in the sustainable mobility is one of the priorities of the, of the, of the current term in the, in the promotion of electric vehicle, is bike or, or car, increasing use of bicycles in uh, daily mobility uh, as a result of the uh, implementation of a new bike line. So. In this regard, uh, future action of the AMB is completely designing and uh, built a metropolitan uh, big uh, back line uh, up to uh, 414 uh, 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 kilometers long. And that is the competence and the metropolitan area and its work, no? But uh, thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the exhibition and good work. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ramon, for the, the introduction. I think all we know a little bit better how is the this institution, and, and also we can see better the, the exhibit. Now, I want, as we said yesterday evening, um, the exhibit is based on on two poles. And one is the like explaining the state of the art of how this city works, like Ramon Torro was defining now, in contrast about what other cities in the world are doing in relation with the global issues. And I think this is what you can see on the exhibit, in the way that 
Barcelona is organized according to eight different chapters, and each chapter responds to certain questions that you can ask yourself about the global issues, about the sustainability, about the social justice. I mean, those are the elements that we face in the exhibit, and that, I think, is... My first words will be about the, to talk and to thank how this research has been possible, because the exhibit is about one research that probably can give new orientation to the future plan for the metropolis, uh, the metropolis of Barcelona, but in a way is, is a research, is talking about the facts that they already exist. But you have, when you research the facts, immediately you tend to enhance certain priorities, certain elements that they are more important than others, and probably that is what starts saying something about what the design should take care, what the planning should give us a priority. Huh? I always, we can never imagine that the things are coming out of the blue, not the things that are always based in reality. But as we said yesterday, we need to use other models, and that's the reason that we're looking to other cities to say how other cities can bring also perhaps model paradigms or elements or lessons like the Dean was saying before. Yeah. I like to, to thank uh, Ramon Torre as a general director. I like to say that he himself is an architect, a designer. He did some of these public spaces before he joined his responsibility as a manager. I think that's very good to imagine that also some of uh, the young generation of students that we are going to to uh, provide and produce, they are going to take responsibilities. I think that's very important. And then, But it's better, in my eyes, that this person has the background and has the experience, because they can understand much better the difficulties of designing. Thank you, Ramon, and that probably is the reason that this uh, research is impossible. And your team, Josep Maria Carreras, Marino, Saurina, people that they are joining here. And mainly, I like to point out some of the, the 12 teams that they were creating this exhibit in Barcelona. Some of the directors are here, Corominas, Valle, Parcerisa, Maria Robert, Crosses. Those people were very helpful. Uh, I think today we will learn from them the experience of their own research and their own practice. But also, it's about the global issues. And the global issues were researched here at the GSD in, in a team that was based this summer, and I'd like to stress the names of Yang, um, um, Adam Himes, uh, Lin, uh, Liang Wang, Nikos Katsakis. Katsakis, those are the persons that make possible that this um, international, that we can say this global look to the to different cities has been glued next to the different chapters. Thank you very much for your contribution. Also, the dean present here, uh, Mohsen Mostafavi, and the chairman, Diana Davis, because with your contribution, it make it happen. Otherwise, these things never could be uh, realized. Eh? The Barcelona exhibit was designed uh, by the team of Josep Buigas. I'd like to thank him. And it's been reshaped here by Eulalia Gomez, Frances Baquet, and Josep Maria Soler. Many thanks to them all. Eh? And later, from the school, we know the team of Dan Borelli. They make always incredible things, because this exhibit has been done in less than one week, the production, I think. This, Incredible, eh? because I know how difficult it is to handle so many different things together. Eh? If we go back to the conference, I think what is interesting in this conference, as the Dean uh, said before, is the target is to start helping redefining urban design. And I think then we use Barcelona as a case study. We can learn from Barcelona, from many other cities. Also, Barcelona learned many things from other cities as well. Eh? But to redefine is always a difficult task. Because you have to redesign in a place where we are discussing something, and the Dean was saying before, where this term was more or less created by Josep Luis Cert. And most probably after 60 years, this concept of what is urban design, this idea that is in the middle, in between the architecture and planning, it becomes far more complex, more interesting, even I would say today. In general, the people, when we are talking about urban design, the people feel urban design is about massing the buildings, giving shape to the buildings. But it's not true. Urban design is more than that. And I think it's, it's something that interconnects and takes into elements of the public space and also takes, as the Dean said before, questions of the political issues and the management of the situation. I think that's very important, that many times we as architects, we don't take that into account, how we can deal with that, how that is possible in any political circumstances or in any condition of governance. I think this is the reason, why, as, as the Dean said before, we have to engage other, other subjects, and sometimes we discuss, 
Is the urban design probably today in our own terms, in Europe we will call in place urban design urbanism? But probably it's a pity that we change the name only because perhaps we have to change the content, we have to change the strategy, and perhaps we can keep, I think, it's giving new meaning to the names, eh? but probably that will be discussed later on the tables. Eh? But I think these subjects for me are very important because that's the way mean that the emerging new culture can bring with our experience, with our research, can bring completely a different type of strategies and different type of practices in the way that we can design the city. I like just to, to show because this is the part of the exhibit that you saw. This is the idea that was created by, by Josep Boigas. The idea that in this exhibit in Barcelona, the ceiling was also reflecting what happened. The idea that, this, that, that Josep had in that moment with his team is the idea that also, you have to give to the people another reading of the city. Otherwise, the, the, the words, like probably in our exhibit, is more technical. But we were addressing exhibit in Barcelona that was referred to uh, all the people. And I would like just to show certain image of the models, because we were unable to create these models here at the GSD because of the, the space and because of the cost. But anyway, the idea that you can present also the city in terms of the metropolitan can be explained by different layers. And I think the idea of layering the city today is very, very powerful. And you can see then how the people are approaching that and they are touching, no, I think that the mobility is more important than the facilities and the topography is more relevant than the water. I mean, these type of things, it's important. People start thinking that there are certain ways to, uh, to discuss. And this part is right here. That is another very beautiful uh, exercise that was how the metabolism enters into the building. That was very interesting in the discussion with the architects. You can see buildings, but what is drawn are not what we usually talk about the, uh, among the architects. It talks about the facades, we talk about the volumes, no, about the wires into the buildings. The real wiring of the building from, from the scale that you can see how the, the pipes and the communication enters and how that filters into that. I think that was really like a clash when we were discussing that among the architects, because the architects said, my God, I never thought about that, this amount, even that we know that amount, but always in our concept of design that comes later, it comes afterwards. So why we don't start thinking? The third element is about, we were talking just about what I usually mention, the spaghettis, yeah? the, the, the intersections, yeah? the cross, the road intersections. When you see them together, then you, you can start uh, imagining the amount of space, and then the people can see that this concept is there, that there is a lot of room around these spaces that you can use for other purposes. And you can see how attentive is this guy about that, what I can do around this spaghetti, you know, that I think it's, it's interesting to see that. And even the same concept, I see this model that was created by Enrique Valle, in a way that metropolis is a concept that sometimes we use at the university, but for the people, the metropolis is made out of pieces. And then by understanding that the city, the metropolis is done by cities, we make a completely different reading. Because meaning that the cities, and that happened the same in Boston. You can say metropolis Boston, yes. But the people of Cambridge, they like to say, but we are a city. And we have our own status. And we like to use the airport in Boston. But at the same time, we want another. And I think this is a good way that we have to start making new concepts into that. That is just to imagine that there are always today a lot of techniques. We said yesterday how the, we can show that the cities doesn't have a form, have many forms, depending on the hours, depending on that. I think those are the ways. Eh? OK, and then just to finish, and that is the most important part of my presentation, I'd like to introduce you know that today we're going to have a keynote speaker, Marion Weiss, and then we have three tables, and finally we have a wrapping up conclusion. It's going to be a heavy and then this morning, as the Dean said, and prevent to us. But for me, I like to introduce, you know very well, but Marion Weiss is the Graham Scheer Professor in Architecture in UPenn, and she has a very active role with her partner, Michael Manfredi, moving her firm to a level of excellence that we, are, we admire. The work is quite well known. I'd like just to point it out, three elements that for me are relevant. The, the Young Center, the extremely beautiful Hunter Point South in New York, both projects in New York. And the third, I'd like to mention, the Seattle Art Museum that was awarded the Harvard University International Veronica Ruch Green Prize in Urban Design 
in 2008. Today, Marion is going to give a keynote speak, and we ask her to explain how she sees the new challenging issues we are presenting in the exhibition, how they are affecting and changing their professional and research work. I'm incredibly pleased that she can accept to share her thoughts with us today. Please uh, join me in inviting Marion to come to the podium. Well, first, a huge thank you, Joanne, to both this invitation, but also this invitation for all of us to learn from this extraordinary exhibit. It's an incredible gift. I think Diane, Mojin have said so before, but it's a gift to be able to consider Barcelona as a lens by which we can envision a future that has always seen urbanism as an intrinsically social, infrastructural, ecological, and territorial uh, synthesis rather than uh, dissynthesis. And also thank you, uh, Ramon Torre, for describing the sense of responsibility that Barcelona sees to taking that legacy forward. So, let's see. It's the green button, which is go. <laughs> so I, I, I want to bring back this larger discussion to something even larger than all of us. Um, we're looking at the lens of the city right now as if it is one city at a time. But in fact, I think as Ramon's very first slide was showing us, it is cities all over and an intensification that is taking over the way we actually shape the world. So it's not an innocent question, but it's one that we need to take seriously, particularly as this image shows, as climate is changing our attention to waterborne cities. Now the spectacle, if you will, of Barcelona is extraordinary. And uh, the work that I will share that follows some of the research that Michael Manfredi and I have done together, in some ways came about in our very early conversations before we opened our practice around two years apart traveling fellowships around Europe, where we both discovered that our soul was brought to life after traveling alone for months and months by the city, which became a kind of a strange lover uh, to arrive at even alone because it felt so full of a kind of life and a vibrancy we had never seen. The city in silhouette, as captivated here by Sagrada Familia, and then also seen also through the grid, Serdis grid, in many ways gets distilled down to something even more essential when we start to think about how the Ramblas came about. And if we look at this now, it is an underpinning, if you will, of a future that I think is a future lens by which we can shape cities. The Rambla, as you know, was at the edge, if you will, the edge of the city as it was de defined at one point. And in the 1440s, the edge of the city, that wall that you can see down the middle, if you will, that fortification became now more or less the center of the city as it could go west. So if the fortification moved, all of a sudden what had been a sewage and a stream and a passageway, a barrier and a moat and a disease-filled location, all of a sudden had an opportunity to go from being an orphan edge to become a central and vital part of the city. Now if you think about the Ramla there in 1778 becoming something so different from an orphan site, but one that could actually solve a double civil engineering problem of subsurface infrastructure, dual roads on either side, but putting not at its side, one or the other, but at its center, a place for public life to take place. Now that is really the interesting thing because the research that Michael Manfredi and I have been doing has been focused on something that we call public natures. And our book that we just put out talks about placing the public back in the city and back in nature. Now, together with the irregularity of the outline of the medieval city, the state of abandonment and the barrenness of its vegetation gave the impression of an indeterminate place, somewhere between a street and glasses. This was written by an unknown author in 1777. Polyzoides later on said, it's really a design opportunity presented in the demolition of the city in the late 1700s, 1860s, that it could become a large-scale linear park, a promenade of civil life, um, and a place where you could, you could arguably say that the life of the city and the nature of the city was brought into core focus. So here is, uh, as they say, the most beautiful street in the world. 
that you never want to end. And that was precisely how I think Michael and I felt when we discovered this intensified version of everything you've always wanted to have in urban life. Now, there's another part, though, just outside the city that really has to do with how we start to shape a city, which is not at, only at its center, but at its periphery. And the gem of the gift, and certainly our passion, for Parkwell has led some of the work that we've done in our studios, both here at Harvard, certainly at Penn, more recently at Yale, which is what is the thickness of the section of the city when we can leverage not only the lateral terrain, but that which is vertical. Now, Parkwell has something uniquely special to Barcelona that we think we need to take inspiration from as we move cities to the forward, which is that that tactile broken glass, that leftover piece, the orphan porcelain in its great chroma could all of a sudden become the signature and the tactile signature of the way we would look again at the horizon of the city and see it as a point of connection. So that tactileness is something that we can't leave behind. That is the art and the craft and the memory by which we understand the city. So nothing like the Spanish spirit to recognize that maybe, maybe it's because the word Catalunya and catalyst seem to share the same beginning, but nothing like the Olympics to say it's a time to move forward to create change. And the silhouette then of the promise of the Olympics was also the promise of the transformation of how people would see Barcelona, not just as a city of the past, but a city of the future. Now, if you look at it before the Olympic, you know, the waterfront before the construction, this was industrial, not accessible to the public, very much the condition of almost every urban city because those places of exchange were also places that were not safe for the public. So the gift of that kind of waterfront transformation is really saying that the edge of the city should expand in many, many different directions, not just through the spaghetti that can be created by more land use at the expanse, but also to intensify the edge. Now, this Park Diagonal by Enrique Morales and Benedetta Tagliblu is one of the ones that I think takes a special exception, as much as Gaudi did, where the detail of this transformation is every bit as important as the actual operation on the edge. Now, this leads to some other uh, projects that uh, I, I had the good fortune of traveling with the jury of the Veronica Rudge Green Place led by Joan Busquets to see the restoration of the Chonga Chim project in Seoul. And this was an amazing case where as we look at the subsurface infrastructure that looks so natural with the body of water inhabited and socialized along the edge, it's easy to forget that this was, in fact, an elevated highway with shops underneath it, a very sort of odd place, yet because the city had grown, becoming increasingly central. And yet, in no other place in the world that I can think of, in exactly two years, the public process, the demolition of the elevated highway, and the simultaneous creation of 27 bridges and the subsurface ecological aquatic infrastructure came about. Remarkable. Now, Michael and I have been looking at this section of the city as something that's not only just a subsurface cut, but elevated. And there was a prototypical and failed utopian here that we studied at Harvard as the extension of the GW Bridge. George Washington Bridge, I think, has become a lot more noted in the press for other lane closings and things like that. But if you think about what it opened up, it did open up the idea of bringing uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi through the Port Authority to come and identify a bus station, double level of bridges but also four towers of affordable housing of 1,000 units apiece. Now, all this was through the destruction of one road, but to keep the speed of the highway going to actually simultaneously create a new part of the city. Strange sort of thing that the Ford Foundation asked then Paul Rudolph to do a study even further because it suggested such promise, but I'll talk about that promise again of the affordability and the infrastructure later. But again, you can start to think that the Clark and Rockwana uh, Brooklyn Heights Promenade, very near to us, again, an operation of a public infrastructure all the way down to simultaneously roads and movement. These preoccupations that we've shared have had us looking at things like, as Joanne describes it as a spaghetti, we absolutely adore the possibility that that spaghetti can also become a coincident place of life and magic and public in its dimension. So I'll break this discussion into three parts, if you will, of what we think through our own projects here in the United States have been able to be codified by trying to move the city forward, usually uh, 
because a, public, a private institution decides to work with a public ambition. So the first set has to do with cultural infrastructures. And you can start to see this interesting thing, the fantasy of Roe Etheridge Junction, Atlanta on the right, this kind of fantasy, this, this romance with the elevated um, world of infrastructure, and then Thomas Cole's uh, Oxbow in the 1800s, the romance of the waterway. But those romances in many ways are nothing like the romance that an art institution can bring to all of these things. And not surprisingly, when we were invited to do the Nelson Atkins Cultural District by the director of the art museum, Julian Zagazioza, of course, he's from Spain. Now, this is interesting. When you've got a director from Spain looking at the condition of Kansas City, you've got this beautiful, fabulous museum uh, right, right at the top, but he's got bigger roads than you could ever imagine could ever create a good city at stake. And as we started to look at it, not only did we have roads by the institution, we had Flooding Brush Creek, which actually had some all kinds of challenges, but all kinds of independent identities had everything working against it to actually form a larger urban identity. So we looked at these archipelago of institutions, and through the enthusiasm and energy of this great director, we were able to meet with every single one of them to say, what if we could all somehow collaboratively find a thread that would intensify the urban identity? And how could we take these isolated, flooding creeks, walled up ports of the section, roads that are way too wide and way too fast, and create these isolated destinations into something that might become a kind of cultural loop? And with that loop, if you will, with the Cleaver Road dividing everything and Brush Creek dividing everything, we could actually create a new armature that would have intensified destinations of landscape. And what we called it was a cultural charm bracelet, whereby everybody could be part of the charm that would emerge in Kansas City's identity. Now, that meant that we had to do a couple of very strategic things like crossing Cleaver. And yet we were lucky enough with some grade change to be able to do so and allow that uh, art of the uh, museum to cross its way to the public park. And you could start to see the possibility of that uh, section in between creating a cafe. And then that flooding creek ultimately becomes no longer this place that one worries about uh, just the geese and the drugs, but actually now a place of recreation because it's embedded in that possibility of the crossing. So again, as a cultural institution starting to change the city, you could say that the trust for the National Mall, when they came to look at the Washington Mall and they saw how difficult it was to do anything besides go from monument to monument, they said, we have lost sight of our nation's central stage as a destination that should be extraordinary. And there was a piece of history that was missing because it had gotten so lost, which is that in 1917, the Sylvan dream, Alice Pike Barney had a dream to say there should be a place of performance at the mall. Now, this was an international competition to actually readdress and, and rejuvenate this theater. And what you could see is that its back was, the, the base of the monument, if you will, the Washington Monument was where the audience would go. And then that little proscenium in plywood is what you would look at for performance. Now that became even worse over time because to protect and secure the base of the monument, they created an edge. And worse still, that became the tour bus destination. So directly behind the stage were all the tour buses. So Washington really didn't have a very good understanding of this sleeve and orphan site as a propitious location which is dead center between the monumental axis of the mall and the sort of beautiful area of the cherry blossoms, all divided, of course, by highways. So we decided it would be very interesting to actually take this Sylvan Theater, reorient it, and imagine that we might have the monument as the backdrop and if we could revise that orientation, all of a sudden we could lift up the backside of the uh, theater backdrop, if you will, and insert all the visitor amenities and, and create a pavilion, and also simultaneously hide the buses. So it seemed possible in this one sleeve of a place to do it all. Now, even on top of that, we could actually then scale the audiences from 100 people to 10,000 people. <laughs> And we could take this particular sad situation as it stood right now into something that could conceal the things that needed to be concealed 
and could then allow the kind of slippage, if you will, of a pavilion into this new uh, topography that we invented and take the grounds as they are today, looking towards the buses and towards it, the uh, cherry esplanade beyond, into something that could also host the 10,000 people by using both sides, a two-sided or three-sided st uh, stage, if you will, um, to actually enhance and create a flexible venue. And the idea then is that it could really become a sylvan grove by day when there was no performance, not just an empty stage, but it could also take advantage of that 40-foot grade lift in the back to cross over and create a new pedestrian bridge that would link to the cherry blossoms. So again, a very simple notion of taking a new kind of infrastructure to actually add potentially some new magic uh, to the city. So. Uh, Again, this question of magic, there's a piece of magic for us, which was the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and we were invited to do the visitor center there, and it was a very funny little hinge, if you will, between the city and this public-private garden, if you will, a botanic garden, still part of the museum, and you could see it near Olmsted's Prospect Park. Now, what was strange is they wanted to actually pierce right through the middle of the park and put a building in there, right in the middle of the park parking lot. And we just said that that would be a shame. In fact, it would be great if we could come from the edge of the city and find our way into this garden. And if we could actually allow ourselves to have a building that might actually wander over 440 linear feet to become a garden, that this idea of urbanness and nature could actually be a kind of unfolding chameleon that could be revealed in section. And so you could start to see this strange kind of unfolding of something that is 100% architecture at the city edge at the bottom of this section, and at the very top, 100% natural topography as it finally enters the garden. And so this is uh, the design as it, as it evolves. And you could see that we actually kept the trope of this urban brown, if you will, to be the copper to match the roofs of the other historic buildings in the garden, um, but also the green to make it effectively a new 10,000 square foot piece of the garden. And you could start to see this kind of uh, trail through light inscribed through the detail of the frit on the pattern on the glass that draws you in, again, an homage, if you will, to Gaudi's detail. Um, that takes you to places of choices, to choose the city on the left or the garden or the right, and then allows you to even have that geometry avoid the drip line, if you will, of the tree, so that the geometries protect that garden, and then lead us into some spaces that are, in, in fact, a only two-sided room in New York that seats 160, uh, because that is now the room underneath this uh, green space that then is a semi-illuminated lift that's barely seen in some cases, detailed in both forms, hosting new life, uh, in fact, concerning the maintenance crew on its roof, uh, but ultimately becoming a kind of foil, a chameleon that is truly 100% part of the garden and 100% part of the city. So the next question, though, is how are we changing our cities? And it seems like the academy has a larger role to change the city. And so academic urbanism is a coined term that Michael Manfredi and I have been sort of toying with because our hunch is that it's this the university that's moving the city forward. If we think of Barnard, um, college as part of the kind of collection of buildings that are associated with uh, Columbia University, this idea of a campus needing to wall itself from the city was, of course, very central and carried forward. But at Barnard, their goal was to not so much wall it off, but to potentially connect to something larger. And in this case, right at the edge of Broadway, we said a 100,000 square foot building can take a clue from a connective landscape and a connective section so that the wall and the barrier that was the city before could become something far more compelling and luminous as it would engage the city again. And it could also become a place of engagement internally that would be legible and transparent, but also transparent from the city edge. And so those barriers, again, become something that unfolds and reaches a new condition, if you will, that ultimately joins the urban identity of both Manhattan and the university proper, but also transforms this notion that a city must have a barrier between the university and the city into one that says it needs to become a connective lens. Now, Cornell University is doing something that is really, in many ways, the vision of Michael Bloomberg to bring tech forward through a university or institution to change the city as a one that could be an economic engine. So Cornell Tech, in many ways, was this idea of saying that 
delayed research from universities, startup entrepreneurialism, could create something in this river-to-river -river condition here, even at Roosevelt Island with this, you know, the vulnerability with the hurricanes to rising water levels into a new campus. So this master plan of a campus is one that will grow over time. But our building is this kind of uh, apotheosis of the idea of a corporate co-location building where it's half academic and half entrepreneurs wedged into one building, which is sectionally above the flood level, um, opened uh, in collaboration with buildings like Tom Main's Morphosis building, open to river river views that then connect to a larger dimension of this city. Again, the sectional infrastructure within the building is public and legible. And you can start to see that that invitation is one that says that the building itself must have a public dimension that returns itself to the city. And now it's in construction and should open in July. I think the openings will be in September. Michael and I were just in the building a uh, day before yesterday. Uh, it's coming along. But it, you could say that the Singh Center of Nanotechnology at Penn, though, becomes another uh, opportunity where Philadelphia and the university itself are trying to come together, and engineering is the lens by which regional people and cross disciplinary folks can uh, somehow take this forlorn area that had been without any nature or academic identity and pull these together into something that could bring art and information and technology into a place or a destination that has a social infrastructure at stake. Now, that social infrastructure unfurls all the way to the very, very top. The, the piece that outreaches the most to the urban dimension is, in fact, a hard-working piece of stormwater management. And so this water collection uh, that takes you into consideration is also now the kind of cantilever and meeting space adjacent to it that reaches out to the urban and academic uh, identity. Most importantly, though, a new green is created where engineering had never had one. And this lens of the infrared protecting amber glass to the laboratory spaces is, in fact, the emblem of this kind of academic invitation that connects both the city and the academy. Now, this question, though, of are academies, in fact, moving the city forward? Well, this became a very active thing at Kent State, where, in fact, the New York Times a few years ago talked about the fact that, indeed, a collaboration between the city and the university were all charged together to build a piece of the city and build a piece of the university. And in fact, they said, let's create this piece of the city and this piece of the academy as something that could be tied together through the landscape, but change the relationship that had been so separate by one that could actually link. And as they said that, they said they had a big gap, as many Midwest places do, of land and roads. And they said, what building could actually make that bridge? So they held an international competition to do an architecture school or a center for architecture and environmental design. And we were fortunate to win that competition. But what, what attracted them to our thinking was that it was indeed far larger than the building. It was indeed the marriage between the city and the academy. And that if we could look at the site they created and actually start to look at that connection they wanted to make, which you can see in the top left of the screen, we could actually take the box of that building, if you will, and inflect it slightly more to open up a lens or an aperture of connection, and then take this notion of stepping down to meet the academy and reaching up to meet the city as the sort of armature of creation of, in fact, a school of architecture that could actually take that section, and no short homage here to the GSD section, of what it means to be able to see people across these uh, spaces and actually understand that that's what creates this collaborative environment. Now, I'll go back a, a couple of slides here because what you'll see here is that Beld and Brick had built most of the university. And we felt if they had built most of the university, they could certainly build this new building and build brick in a new way. And so we went back to their beehive kiln, again, homage to Gaudi's, the tactile being important and actually discovered that we could get five different colors of iron spot brick created and a new fin created to actually, through that invention, levitate brick that used to be gravity bound and embedded to shape the university to now lift up to reach the city. And that tactile nature then, uh, this was just taken about two weeks ago by a young girl actually touching the bricks with the new fins that were the custom brick that actually are part of what shapes this kind of urban connector 
And in fact, that urban connector as it moves around um, is one that actually has this kind of front uh, diorama, almost a movie screen back to the university of what you might discover inside. And of course, what you discover inside is that every school of architecture uh, is one of the most alive places you can ever see. Not so alive here because it's a third day of school. It just opened um, this September. But you can see, though, the kind of unfolding and layering of what it means with the critique glass boxes on the left looking down, students running up, and then the esplanade that connects the town and the university together on the right. And, and then, of course, the cafe open to not only the university students, but the city is down below. And you can start to see now even this hint of light around the edge of the library, this kind of cascading signal to the city that even you can come into the library and use the library and use the materials library because it is something that they want the urban people to understand is of value and welcome to them and not just the lectures that you can see in the classroom beyond. But it is this delicate relationship to the materials of the city itself, which are not so emphatic as Barcelona, but in fact far subtler, that make us discover that it is also a piece of nature. This is a lead platinum building with an educational green roof um, that's still in its infancy. But you can start to see this kind of hybridity between being part of the city, part of nature, part of Kent, and ultimately uh, part of a new infrastructure. So this leads then to this last, the last two projects which have to do with what is um, the face of our cities as they face the water and we face climate change and we face rising waters. This is Iwan Bond's incredible photograph after Hurricane Sandy when it became very apparent that while we worry about our smartphones and everything staying alive, we never think that the city can be shut down literally in Manhattan from the waist down. Now, that actually shut out and, and created all of our, our thinking ahead. But we had had the opportunity to rehearse some of these questions in Seattle uh, before the last project I'll show at Hunter's Point. But in this case, at the Olympic Sculpture Park, again, a museum leading the city forward with a quest to actually create a sculpture park that was open and free to the public taking three orphan sites divided by a highway and train tracks, a, fu a fully contaminated site, a failing seawall, and an Amtrak, and a high-bodied, wide-bodied federal trucking route. Now, this is a strange kind of site for a museum to say, we'd like to create a sculpture park. In fact, they said, let's do three parks, two bridges by artists, and we're done. Um, when we entered the competition, we felt that that would be a disappointment and said that there should be perhaps one park that might wander from the city to the water's edge. And with 360,000 cubic yards of earth, we could actually reform this 40-foot grade change and actually create a new topography for art and public life. Now, it seems that what this show has done for us and what I think Joanne is preoccupied with particularly with that great model that had all the wires and the subsurface things, is to give us an infrastructural lens of what a city might be or even a building for us to rethink what maybe a public dimension could offer. And so here we are, you know, we're preoccupied with everything. There's train lines, there's everything. We even found that we can get like a $2 million grant for salmon habitat refurbishment. You know, all these things are running through your mind when you try to come up with something very, very simple. So one needs to be very systemic and systematic about that analysis, about the subsurface, about the water collection, about the, uh, the contamination uh, that you could see with all the contaminant wells, the water's edge, the planting, and even one mile of teledata uh, stretched through the park. It becomes important then to construct a setting that would feel as if it had always been there. And that sectional construction really benefited from the excavation of the downtown museum that created all the earthwork that we could effectively get for free. Now, this kind of organized topography, one starts to think about budgets. And I was stunned at how, um, how unaware we were of how expensive it might build to cost to build infrastructure. For a budget of $35 million, we, th we said we could pour all the poured in place walls and then build the earth. And our client said that that's your total budget. So we had to rethink things. One needs to be strategic. And so we actually went to highway engineers and Magnus and Klemenchuk, our engineers, said, let's do this kind of um, MSE, mechanically stabilized earth 
uh, and we can actually build up the earth that way. And then Michael and I said, let's do these precast panels another 42 inches above that that could actually be overlapped so they'd be seismically flexible, and that somehow we could do all this for an awful lot less. So that gave us the money back to build the rest of the park, to build the pavilion, to support the art, um, and to think of this infrastructure as one that could actually make links to landmarks like the Seattle Needle and their Space Needle, but also a new beach. Now, the pavilion itself is a kind of opening. In many ways, it takes the unfolding gesture that formed the park to also form and inform this pavilion itself. And the valley, if you will, created both through excavation and amplification to cross the road, also created a site for Richard Serra's piece, Wake, and, of course, the Wake Up crew that does yoga every Saturday morning. So this idea that a setting can be flexible and be changed and be a social infrastructure and not just an artistic infrastructure becomes interesting. And that hybridity is one that the idea of crossing and transfer and things that had seen obstructive like roads could be magical and that the dead center point of the road might also be the dead center point of where you would want to be in the park. And so again, you could start to see that even those who are in vehicles are part of this experience and those who are in trains are seeing something as beautiful to, of Teresita Fernandez's uh, glass work that we created a setting for with this throw fence. And of course, the train spotters on the left are a new population that we just learned about. Again, this kind of idea of layering and unfolding the city, of transforming what was a parking lot into something that is a place for joggers or even a habitat for a beach here. And you can see the stabilization of the shoreline in that subsurface section. And now it literally is an ongoing habitat uh, thing that is being monitored by the <coughs> University of um, Washington. Now, again, this idea of an infrastructure that can fully connect people and connect to the water is something that takes us back to the last project, which is really on our coast back in New York, Hunters Point South Waterfront Park. Now, this is a case of a leftover orphan site, and nobody, of course, ever envisioned that Queens would become the destination that it is today. But if we look at what it was as a wetland ecology, then an urban grid, and then an active port, the lower left view is what we discovered. And you can start to see, though, that what it is is something far larger than the edge of this site, but something that takes in the panorama, but still the vulnerability of the kind of aqueous setting that it's in. And this is right after Hurricane Sandy, the site as it was. Now, again, though, if we think about it, this is really a vision that Mayor Bloomberg said we could drive the city forward. In fact, if we build the infrastructure first and build the park first, we can now do with our largest affordable housing that we have ever done in the city since that high bridge towers that I just showed you. And so since this is really an amazing scale project, you could start to see that we looked at interpretive corridors, ecological bands, green infrastructures, and site circulation as something that could be done in a new way. So stormwater management with the permeal pavements, and uh, this kind of smart streets uh, idea is one where the intensified active uses are there in the north, which is the left of your page, and on the south, the more passive recreation. But here we have, you know, 3,800 linear feet of shoreline of which 88% is soft, 12% hard, and that new equation of what is hard and soft needed to be understood in a very different way when we think about flooding. So you can start to see this possibility that it's also a buffer and a protector of the housing beyond as a kind of soft infrastructure. This kind of subsurface below that you can see allows things like the East River to flow in and out in terms of an aqueous wetland that you can see closest to us. And that aqueous piece right now, uh, the pier that's projecting out, is really a double level infrastructure with a kind of social deck above and a kind of wandering walk of a subsurface revetment that protects the wetlands that are inboard of that water-based uh, path. Now, this is under construction right now. The shop drawings are more complex than we ever dreamed of, but they have just been approved, so um, stay with us. This is a phase that's under construction, but the phase right now that is unfurled and li literally offered us, again, as we had talked about with Gaudi, a new connection to the city, is indeed the center part here. So here is the recreation area and the pavilion, which I'll talk a bit about, and here it is in its ability to actually be a temporary guard, if you will, from uh, storm waters. The kind of overall identity here, you can start to see this kind of wandering set of events of the intensified uses. 
And indeed, even the dog run that you can see is now divided into two. Talk about community process. What started out as one dog run became two dog runs for large dogs and small dogs. It nearly became four dog runs because aggressive dogs and passive dog owners <laughs> had to desire. In any case, the public process is dynamic. We learned a lot from it. There are two. We stuck with two. But you can start to see, though, that the legacy of the industrial past could come forward with the rail garden and in collaboration with Thomas Balsley, who br brought these plantings to life. We really were able to bring into focus things that had been lost, like the beach. And the recreation of water taxi beasts as something closer to the water taxi came about. But the biggest debate between the Design Commission and the Parks Department played out here in the Oval. We had a 100% turf lawn. Parks Department said it needed to be 100% artificial turf. They weren't going to maintain it after the first rain and the first soccer game. Um, there was a huge battle, so they drew up a diagram for us to build a rectangle of artificial turf surrounded by little ellipses, four of them, of, of regular grass. We said, we're designers, we can do better. And so what you could see there is a tight oval of artificial turf and then a crescent of elevated natural turf. Now around this area though, you can see that the endurance of this as a public destination, not just recreation, was played out uh, very recently this past spring when Bernie Ran uh, Sanders had his rally and indeed the Parks Department was thrilled that it was an artificial turf. Um, but it really is, in fact, uh, a, a kind of a neighborhood place, not just an urban place. And you can start to see what unfolds there is pretty interesting because the unfolding of this, um, if you will, shade pavilion was again another reaction to our guidance from the city. They asked for four structures, a maintenance pavilion, a, con a food concession, restrooms, and a sunshade pavilion for the water taxi comers. And, and they said, can you do those four different buildings? And we said, we'd rather do one. And so this really unfurls and unfolds and becomes the shelter for the water taxi towards us and the maintenance pavilion in back and the food pavilion in the center. And it really becomes now ultimately this place where the kind of new infrastructures of mobility for the city, which include the water taxi, are now meeting a, a new identity. And in fact, as we start to think about how we reshape our cities and, and what it means to look to shape this, the future, I think Michael and Freddie and I have come to see that in many ways, this kind of sense of the horizon being brought into focus, the detail that we think of that we were inspired by Gaudi, is one that allows us to understand our relationship to the city and allows us to dream about what the city can become. Thank you. We will start with the first table, and we were discussing perhaps to do the break after the first table in between the first and the second. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Adam Himes. I'm a second year uh, Master of Architecture and Urban Design student. Uh, thank you, Marion, for the uh, fascinating and um, uh, inspirational uh, lecture. I think the work hits on a lot of the issues that we'll be uh, hopefully bringing up in this first panel about um, the public nature of infrastructure, the importance of, of this section, uh, bringing the issue of, uh, or the idea of ecological thinking into, into infrastructure. Um, it's multi-scalar and multifunctional nature. Um, I'll be moderating the first of these uh, three roundtable discussions, uh, which will consist of three short presentations by our, our panelists, uh, which will um, be followed by a question and answer period with the audience. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't intervene between the presentations. Uh, each panelist will present uh, one after another, and we'll take uh, questions from the audience collectively at the end. Uh, this first discussion will center around the topic of uh, in infrastructure and contemporary urban design. Uh, Barcelona serves as an exemplary case study for the integration of both mass transit systems and public amenities into, the, into existing infrastructural spaces, which you uh, have seen both in the presentations this morning as well as in examples in, uh, on the walls in the hallway. Uh, infrastructure, and particularly, particularly mobility infrastructure, uh, the emphasis of this first panel, is central to addressing some of the most pressing urban issues today, including accessibility and affordability uh, of our cities and the ongoing challenge of climate change. These concerns have made the implementation of alternative forms of transportation to the private automobile, including metros, bikeways, and rapid bus lines, central to many contemporary urban developments. Uh, however, city makers have learned from the negative social impact of the worst of modern era infrastructural development and understand that mobility infrastructure has an influence beyond its physicality 
and a responsibility beyond the efficiency of, time, of travel time. Uh, new and existing infrastructure must be scaled or rescaled to address not only the needs of the private motorist, but also public transit riders, pedestrians, bicyclists, re and residents of the areas they pass through. An ideal of hyper-accessibility is sought in which all parts of the city and all types of services and amenities are easily accessible by all who participate in urban life. In developing these hybrid linkages, there is an understanding in urban design today that transit infrastructure can support new development and revitalize depressed or underutilized areas. This is particularly critical as cities today compete to provide the most attractive conditions for creative industries so necessary to induce innovation and drive the 21st century knowledge economy. Um, today we are joined by three panelists who will each deliver a short presentation that addresses one or more of these issues. Uh, Mirko Zardini is an architect and has been the director and chief curator of the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal since 2005, where he has curated or co-curated such exhibits as 1973, Sorry Out of Gas, Imperfect Health, The Medicalization of Architecture, and the upcoming It's All Happening So Fast, an exploration of Canadians' conflicted relationship with the natural landscape through case studies from the last five decades. He has written a number of books and essays and was editor of Casabella from 1983 to 88 and Lotus International from 88 to 99. Served on the editorial board of Domus from 2004 to 2005 and has edited individual issues of Croquis and Archi magazine. Today, Mirko will be exploring the meaning of infrastructure and its changing relationship with the ideals of civicness and efficiency. Uh, Josep Parcerisa is a practicing architect and urban designer who has held the position of full professor of urbanism at the Escola Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Barcelona, the ETSAB, since 1991 and has been an invited professor at universities around Europe and Latin America. His research has been published internationally in journals and magazines including Perspecta, Lotus International and Quaderns, and he was a founding editor of the journal Urbanismo Revista as well as De Ur, a publication of the Lab Laboratory de Urbanismo of which he is a member. Joseph has collaborated with an, another of our visiting panelists, uh, Maria Ruberte de Ventos, on speculative projects for the Vinti do Sarova Innovation District in Barcelona, as well as research centered around public transportation and metropolitan urbanism, which led to the publication of their book, Metropolitan Galaxies. Today, Joseph will speak about Barcelona's success in integrating large infrastructural projects, as well as the relationship between the street and the public metro system. Jonathan D. Solomon is an associate professor and director of architecture, interior architecture, and designed objects at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He received a BA from Columbia University and an MArc from Princeton University and is a licensed architect in the state of Illinois. Jonathan's drawings and writings have appeared in the book Cities Without Ground and 13 projects for the Sher Sheridan Expressway, and he currently edits 45, a journal of outside research. In 2010, he was the curator of the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale, and today he will be speaking of the unique infrastructural response deployed in Hong Kong in response to the city's urban density and topography. Uh, without further delay, uh, please welcome our first presenter, uh, Mirko Zardini. Good morning, and uh, thanks, Professor Davis. Thanks, John Busquets, for the invitation. And thanks, Marion, for the uh, inspiring presentation. So in a certain way, after this presentation, uh, uh, my task is very easy. Uh, my question is uh, recapturing public spaces. I wonder if anybody in the audience is against that. No? <laughs> Fine. So it means that it's useless, because if we all agree, uh, we don't uh, have, any, have any friction to go forward in the discussion. So <laughs> let's look a little bit. You know, it's always like uh, this architecture of good intention. Uh, in contemporary architecture, how can I say? planning, urban design. We are trying to recapture a kind of a role for our discipline, embracing a lot of good causes. Good causes in itself, they are not good. You know, what is important is how you, we manage this kind of objective. So the instrumentality is crucial in defining the result that we are dealing with. 
that is uh, the reason that I think the Marion presentation was very interesting. So let's start uh, to deal uh, with one question that is at the base of this panel. And uh, I have a problem with uh, the word infrastructure. Uh, I was looking a little bit at uh, Marion uh, and Vice Manfred, Manfred and Weiss book, uh, their work, uh, and she today also at a certain point mentioned social infrastructure, speaking of, uh, of Seattle. So let's speak a little bit of this uh, use of the word infrastructure that we do. You know, it's not anymore only the pipe, the pipelines uh, underground in Europe, uh, sometimes not here, the infrastructure system uh, that are serving the urban network is not, uh, we use that for mobility and most of this panel will be about, about that. We use that uh, for the green spaces. And uh, now, and uh, it's not only in the work uh, of uh, Manfred and Weiss, but also in BIG, for example, is emerging in a very consistent way, this idea of social infrastructure. And social infrastructure, what is this today, is mainly what was a public building 100 years ago. So why did we arrive to the necessity to use the word infrastructure to define uh, and add the adjective social to define what it was uh, uh, some time ago, uh, simply a public building. So, uh, one century ago in North America, um, in a moment when uh, city planning was, uh, and uh, urban design was emerging, um, design for mobility infrastructure, uh, public buildings, garden spaces, were defined uh, not only for their, uh, how can I say, uh, technical underlying character, but uh, for their public significance. And as a kind of civic art, is enough to go back to Egerman and Pitts, uh, civic art. And you will find most of the example presented today by Marion, as an example of civic art, not as an example of infrastructure. So um, I'm not able to give an answer to, to this point. I think it would be nice to raise this uh, discussion uh, in later. The second point that I would like to address uh, uh, as a discussion is about the idea of scale. I think that uh, from an environmental point of view, uh, we address today a very, very complex problems. The complexity is a very, very, has increased a lot. So it's coming out uh, very clearly from uh, the discussion from uh, the last comments of Ed Soja, but also from uh, unexpected uh, uh, contribution from other fields like uh, Giddens, that uh, the complexity of the environmental situation implies uh, a return to larger scale planning. So I think that this is an interesting point to look at. So the return of uh, planning, regional planning according to Soja, whatever planning according to Giddens, as an inevitable necessity to address the complexity of the contemporary situation. On the base of an em environmental emergency that uh, we have more or less uh, to acknowledge. So, there are two comments here. I think that on one side, uh, I see that there are a lot, uh, there has been a lot of work already done. I think that the idea of ecological urbanism at uh, GSD has been a very smart anticipatory move uh, in this direction. I think that the issues of environmental uh, could mobilize a large uh, support to move in this direction. And uh, because it is inevitably to acknowledge the fact uh, of a, a public role 
in uh, defining uh, the, the urban space. A public role that uh, 30 years ago, in a certain way, was, uh, especially in Europe, uh, was totally dismantled. Uh, we have to acknowledge uh, that the game in between uh, planning and urban design is always connected to a lot of different political situations. And in a certain period, at least in Europe, the triumph of urban design, conceived in a certain way, was also related to the deregularizations of the control of the uh, land and the territory in favor of localized uh, large-scale intervention managed by public or private intervention. So yesterday night, John Busquet asked me to give an answer to the, um, in the tour of the exhibition to uh, Professor Davis' question between uh, the relationship between uh, planning uh, and urban design. So my answer yesterday night was, uh, could have been very easy because I would have said, how do you expect me to solve this problem, to give you this indication when GSD for 50 years has not been able to manage that? Uh, but uh, today, I think that um, uh, when um, Dean Mustafavi uh, raised, I think, a very interesting angle in respect to this point, when he, he spoke of urban design as a negotiation uh, culture, now, the problem is, uh, I like a lot of attitude of negotiating. The problem, perhaps, is the objective of this negotiation that we could ask. But, uh, so that is the second argument for my point. And the third is that inevitably planning brings to our memory the idea of uh, um, abstract planning, uh, strategic plan, totally detached from physical environment. Now, if you look at this exhibition and the change of scale that this analysis of Barcelona is introducing, you see that uh, what is interesting is the idea of a, a physical um, representation of a lot of material and problems that, uh, let's say, 30 years ago would have been represented mainly in an abstract way. And that, I think, is an interesting point. But one point that we have to take into account is also what could be the character of the physical space in this kind of different regional dimension. Because the, the character of this suburban, ex-urban, uh, other cities, uh, whatever uh, development, especially in Europe, is very different from the competent city that we use at. So, in terms of character of the public space or character of this intervention, I feel that uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion to be done. I think that there is an example in the old Barcelona project in the 80s that uh, could be interesting for us to keep in mind, to get an idea of where I wanted to go, which is uh, the Edward Brew project for the Val de Bron, in which uh, Edward Brew was trying to displace a kind of a different idea to interpret uh, this kind of new physical landscape, the consequence of the modern kind of planning and uh, the suburban development of Barcelona. And that is the third point for the discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning. First of all, uh, thanks Professor Mosen von Stafabi and Diane Davis uh, for, her invitation, for his invitation to this conference. I would also like to thank Professor Busquets, whose idea it was to make um, his university aware of these works on Barcelona. This one could be the first one. This one? OK. John was uh, one of my teachers at the architectural school a long time ago. 
And together with the late, with the late Professor Manuel Sola Morales, he founded the Urbanist Laboratory that I now have the pleasure of coordinating. I would also like to express thanks to Mr. Ramon Tora, the Chief Architect of Metropolitan Area of Barcelona, because thanks to him, we have been able to continue this work of the last three years. In this talk, I would like to raise two issues, uh, which I think might be of general interest and links with some of the questions you have been discussing this morning and also yesterday. The first, in fact, is a key to understanding urbanism in Barcelona during the last quarter of the 20th century. A key that it's not always evident, but may help you to better understand this exhibition. As been said, it all started in the late 80s. Up to that time, Barcelona carried out major infrastructure improvement in a similar way of many large cities in the Western world. I am reminded of Paris Boulevard Périphérique, built at the major motorway, while in the heart of the city, the banks of the River Seine, the famous Quai, were made into expressway. The phenomenon was particularly visible in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and in Hamburg, Germany, which had been reconstructed from scratch after the heavy bombing they had received during the war. How was Barcelona able to confront the issue of having a large urban road network in a very innovative and exemplary way from the 80s onward? I did so because the construction of the major infrastructure designed for cars arrived later in Barcelona than in ever other major European cities. This was because um, Spain, this is a dark image, Spain was isolated from the Marshall Plan <laughs> for political reasons after the civil war between 36 and 39. There followed the period of autarkic, which did not begin to break down until 1509, 20 years. The emergency of an open market economy only really took off in 1960. Then, big cities like uh, Barcelona experienced the impact of the emergency of the new infrastructure to save the car. In this exhibition, there are images, like this one, that testify how the urban freeways were built at that time. Other images show us or, or remind us how the existing large urban avenues were transformed into expressways. Other other demonstrate how some of our large urban squares were destroyed in order to serve the needs of the omnipotent automobile. However, however, the first oil crisis in 73, with its consequent huge and sudden increase of the price of gasoline, brought about a U-turn in many political public policies. In Barcelona, the problem of urban freeways had begun, but there had not been enough time to complete it. This was, yeah, this was what was built at that time, at the broken time. This all means that the system of urban highways and arteries was interrupted and subjected to a powerful criticism from the citizen inhabitants, especially the, the, the urban sector affected by the barrier of these new roads, and technical criticism pointed out the error of visions of Unidirectional traffic. From 69 onward, the decision taken in Barcelona was something, let's say, something Salomonic. I mean, it was decided that traffic in segregated lanes will be uh, reduced uh, to a minimum. This could be a sort of a minimum. In addition, the plans will now include key critical projects, as well as the segregated lane system it was deemed necessary to make the best to construct new streets and avenues running through the neighborhoods where the new arterial was to pass. In economic terms, it was said that this would generate positive externalities for the affected urban lane, uh, areas. And let me say, in a strategic terms, it will turn a problem in a, into an opportunity. Like, like, let's say, uh, in some projects of, uh, from Mario, I have seen uh, a few minutes ago. 
This was then the reason behind the success of Barcelona Rim Roads. They were, uh, they were able to provide urban structures that were closer, <coughs> closer to a human scale. So, let me say, um, the questions, uh, the answer to the question of how Barcelona faced building a large urban road network in a quite exemplary way at that time is twofold. Firstly, because, um, because there had been a delay that allowed the city to gain perspective through learning from the experience of, of other cities. It's a very uh, simple uh, question, but it seems too important. What's important is what we are looking at what happens and we are doing a criticism by taking uh, uh, an example of how could we improve in a way. And the second, or the second, the second uh, reason, of course, is because um, there was um, in place a politically, culturally, and technically able society that could translate these plans into a multifacetic and well-adapted project. But let me say something else to finish that point. I think it's imp this is something new that maybe some of you has experienced uh, walking in Barcelona, but I have to, 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 to uh, talk a little bit now. I think it's important to emphasize the absolute success of the policy of the micro scale, not little, micro scale. Since 1990, Barcelona City Council has adopted a formal template for the construction of side world curbs based on granite with, with uh, stones along with the standard solutions for the interface between, between the road surface for the, uh, uh, the road surface and the sidewalks. This model, this model with uh, a few variants has become obligatory in public spaces, whatever the reason for the works has now been applied for over 25 years. Yeah, something that has 25 years old been applied in any work on the streets. The result has been that little by little, the comfort of all those who use the sidewalks has become the center of public space and the public policy. The consequence of thinking about mobility in an integrated way has been the pampering of pedestrians. In a way, we could describe this as an urbanism that conform the skin of the city. Well, the secondary, the secondary issue that I want to put on the table is about the subway system. While the road structure of the city must have pedestrians, the city traveler becomes metropolitan when he or she accesses the subway. What's the key to the mobility of people in any metropolis, in any big city? We know that the subway or metro forms the center of human mobility throughout any metropolis. Indeed, I can be said that it makes metropolises feasible. Today, let today more than 180 cities in the world have subways. They have become a kind of universal systematic principle. Subway lines represent of, of an invisible arteries that makes large human agglomerations viable. So easy. The point the point I want to make is a curious particularity of Barcelona. We have had a subway since 1924. However, 20 years ago, we at the, at the university, we at the Barcelona Urbanism Laboratory, realized that for many years, there had been no clear, determined and decided policy when it came to the continuous development of the metro. It's curious why the culture of, of the skiing, as I referred to before, was being celebrated and developed. The complementary culture, that is the progress in metro, had remained undervaluated with no plans for its future. 
That was an incredible paradox. Part of the problem was that there were sort of political difficulties, but there were also a perception of prejudice against the subway. Yeah, prejudice against the subway. I heard often, oh, do you really mean that it's n that uh, is a need to expand the Barcelona's metro? This diffuse opinion forced us to demonstrate that there clearly was a need to expand the subway system. And if such an expansion were necessary, we also had to ask what need doing and how it should be carried out. In the first decade of the 21th century, professor, friend, and architect Maria Roberto Ventosa and myself helped put the subway firmly back on the political agenda. This was an image of, uh, on, on yellow of the, uh, new, uh, of the new station that we need to produce, and, and just in blue, what exists at that time. And do that uh, in a sort of a more precise analyze in the, in the central city of Barcelona. In order to do that, in order to argue that, we developed comparative studies of 28 cities in the world. So we have, it's so important that we have to be sure that we have to defend what was our positions on that. And you, we design an atlas of maps to prove that when planning the future of, the, uh, of a city, the subway must form an essential part of the urbanistic discussion. We observed, compared, and studied subway networks, read about the topology of the interchange stations, and defined ease accessibility scenarios for the matrices associated, associated with, uh, with each network. That's why, since then, we have referred to it as the galaxy. The subway galaxy in every city speaks with its own accent of the structure of the city that it's above on the surface. I would like to end to offer some examples um, to further explain my point. We did three, three, three maps, one about the lines, one about the air service, and one about the stations and the quality of simple on diverse stations. This is Chicago, this is New York, also Moscow, uh, the lines in Moscow. Always the framework of the analysis was um, 10 for 14 kilometers square, like that, with uh, the same scale, 125,000, in order to make a comparison. Let's say how oh, in Moscow the distance between stations has a model different from, from other cities, like Paris. This is absolutely the opposite images. And this was, is, uh, let's say, in London, um, when a, 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 a huge uh, uh, discussion between the center and other areas. Also think on London, this is in Paris. Also thinking in London, we realize what, what important could be let's say the Jubilee line, the first line going through, through the south bank of the city. This was uh, at that time what important was uh, with four tunnels crossing the times. The European, central European model with, uh, let's say, an important central station uh, that was uh, always here, okay, and the suburban uh, railway system uh, linking with the metro. And let's say some cities known as uh, pedestrian or uh, tramway cities like Amsterdam has start with, with the first line, uh, for the metro line. And let me say one of the uh, fantastic examples that uh, on, on Copenhagen, where you can see a, a, very, a very clever strategy of metro line crossing the, the Baltic Mare, uh, Baltic Ocean and, and the, the airport and also the first the first, the first uh, metro lines, of course. And let me say, uh, in order to finish, this is the example of Tokyo, and in Japan, that in a way is um, the, the icon on public transport. So at the end, the network explains the nature of the center, the secondary priorities, the degree of the interaction, tension, the canton, density, saturation. It's a reflection of the deeper structure of a city. Decisions made about the design of underground infrastructure is a huge responsibility because change are irreversible. Let me say, if you like cities, please, 
then give some time thinking about the future of the suboid networks. Thank you very much. All right. We're behind, right? Um, fantastic. How do I control this with this thing, presumably? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Motion. Thank you, Johan. Um, I've been nervous about how to admit that I've never been to Barcelona. Um, but perhaps I'm the first one. I wasn't here yesterday even, so I don't know. I think I've been brought in to present a kind of a counterpoint. Um, and um, the, the, the idea here is not to be, be critical in any way of the urban environment in Barcelona, but perhaps um, to suggest that we, be, we take care in how we carry the values that we perceive in the successes uh, in Barcelona to other places, how we universalize them. This is a project about Hong Kong and about dense uh, uh, pedestrian infrastructure uh, in a kind of a unique environment, but it's also a project about looking very closely at uh, at urban conditions and, and, and looking individually at them. In other words, it's a project about how if we're not careful to look afresh and anew in each new place, we can, um, we can end up um, uh, f failing to recognize uh, the, the opportunities implicit in, in, each individual, um, in each individual city and culture. So here, uh, is the first book I bought when I moved to Hong Kong in 2006. It's a book called The Hong Kong Guidebook. Uh, it is modeled uh, after the A to Z of London, uh, famously drawn by um, Phyllis Pearsall, an, essentially an amateur mapper, who noticed uh, that there was no comprehensive atlas, there was no comprehensive map of London. Uh, and by kind of walking around, by walking the streets, she drew uh, a comprehensive guide to the streets and squares of the city. Now, London, um, like, like Barcelona, is largely a city which is a pedestrian. You can understand through a language of streets, squares, urban rooms, etc. Um, Hong Kong, it, of course, is not. Um, and, and this book, while helpful, in indicating to a driver how they might navigate an automobile uh, through the city's road network is really useless as a pedestrian because Hong Kong does not look like Barcelona uh, or London. It is not a city of streets and squares. It, it, it looks as a pedestrian often um, like this, a kind of a dense knot of three-dimensional uh, pedestrian passages, maybe outside, maybe inside, or like this, a network of um, uh, uh, privatized, corporatized, or, or commodified uh, uh, kind of glossy high-end interiors. Um, this is not simply a, a kind of a raised deck, a traditional raised deck condition. It is um, a a actually a, a complex three-dimensional network that, that moves over, at, under uh, the ground plane often duplicating it, often um, in, in most cases negating it entirely. So um, it, it was clear, um, you know, it was clear to me. And, 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 and just very quickly, I'd say there's a, there's a kind of a history of this network which um, begins relatively informally. It begins with kind of opportunistic linking together of uh, properties owned by the same developer. Uh, it extends into the realm of government planning in attempts to effectively move the population from, from harbor front ferries over new widened highways and into the, the uh, interior of the, of the city. And it's, it's developed, or it had developed by, by 2006 when I encountered it, it had developed into a, 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 a partnership between, let's say, government-oriented, top-down government-oriented planning processes and more bottom-up or developer-driven desires to maximize uh, foot traffic past um, uh, uh, essentially rentable shop fronts. Um, it includes some, some uh, kind of standout moments like the central and mid-levels escalator here um, on the day of its opening uh, in the 1990s, um, which, which um, in a series of kind of linked escalators 
took a kind of a sleepy neighborhood behind the central business district and, and by allowing easier pedestrian access transformed it into a, a, a kind of a bustling uh, entertainment district. Or um, moments like this, this is the, the uh, Times Square shopping mall in Causeway Bay, which was built uh, along the, the American model of the um, atrium shopping mall and then later retrofitted. So um, these, all these sort of black trusses, trust escalators are, are actually skip stops. They run between two or three floors, allowing you to shave like 95 seconds or something off of the trip up the traditional switchback escalators by spiraling up through the interior, um, filling that void with, with circulation. But, but you know, from my part as a, as a, a, a city observer, um, I arrived and thought what's missing here is the comprehensive view, a way to kind of look at this space, to see it uh, uh, either from a technical perspective as a planner or, or, or designer, or, or as a, on an amateur perspective, simply as a inhabitant of the city. So um, this woman is looking at a map of uh, the central business district, trying to figure out how to get from the escalator down to the waterfront, and is having a hard time for a variety of reasons. I've, pointed out that this map uh, has north oriented down, which is a problem. Um, but, but the real problem is that that kind of big undifferentiated pink mass in the middle of her path, um, the IFC Mall, International Financial Center Mall, it isn't rendered in any detail. She can kind of figure out how to get there on the lines of the network, but then once there, you know, what happens? Well, in fact, once there, she will find that um, the IFC Mall, like every mall in Hong Kong, has a map of itself that it's drawn that's actually highly detailed. So it's not that this information doesn't exist, it's just not all in one place. Similarly, uh, under the IFC mall, there's a, a multi-level train station, uh, high-speed rail to the airport, et cetera, uh, Hong Kong station, which um, again, draws itself uh, in, in, in great detail, but no, no notion of what's above it, no notion of what it connects to, et cetera. So, uh, m my project, along with uh, colleagues Adam Frampton and Clara Wong, was to, um, again, quite literally by walking the streets ourselves and, and a group of students we worked with, um, walking the streets, carefully taking note, carefully referencing um, maps like the ones I just showed you, to draw uh, that pedestrian infrastructure as a continuity, like the A to Z of, of, of London did for the street networks uh, of, of separate neighborhoods showing how train stations, shopping malls, uh, uh, ferry terminals, uh, corporate lobbies, hotel lobbies, et cetera, roof gardens, work together as part of a continuum. And we did that for sites like the IFC Mall. Um, we did that for sites um, like Mong Kok East, uh, where you see the, the uh, there we go, the, the train station linking through the hotel lobby, down several escalators, over a footbridge to an elevated park where um, elderly men come and show off their birds, um, and then back over another footbridge and, and onward. Um, to public housing estates um, like Lam Tin, where uh, a, a kind of train bus station in the podium of a housing complex is linked through three shopping malls and eight levels of escalators. Or if you're like this lone granny and you would rather take the stairs, you can walk up a very long set of steps. Um, to a, uh, a public housing estate on the, on the hillside above it. Uh, we looked at ways in which the atmospheres of this network start to create hierarchies where, again, without a kind of traditional figure ground relationship in the city, uh, one, one cannot locate oneself on the basis of solid and void, square and building, etc. So we looked at, for example, the network of footbridges in, in Central. Uh, the very first of these, the one I showed you in, in, that, in that initial slide, um, lost somewhere in here. Um, a, a chaotic network. Uh, there are some, some old kind of colonial public spaces like Statue Square hidden in there, but very hard to discern order. Um, we laminated uh, temperature and humidity on top of that and found that, in fact, orders would emerge. So. Uh, High-end shopping environments are heavily air-conditioned. Transit stations are more lightly air-conditioned. And of course, the outside is sweltering. And everybody, you know, the, the cars are all frigid as well. And the trains, I'm afraid, are the coldest thing 
in the city. Um, this, you know, famously, of course, this is uh, Statue Square, the HSBC headquarters, and the the uh, gathering of foreign domestic workers in the shade, of course, under um, the atrium of the HSBC. Now, of course, there are many reasons to gather there. Shade is a natural one, um, but it it it. And I'll end here um, because I'm under such time pressure. Um, I'll end. Here. So the, the the notion, you know, that we ended with was that. Um, far from being simply a kind of infrastructure for public passage, this network and its new hierarchies creates a space for public life. Um, this is the original Occupy Central, uh, which was a offshoot and the longest running offshoot of Occupy Wall Street. Um, Occupy Wall Street, of course, occurred adjacent to the space of global capital in Zuccotti Park. Here in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong, HSBC, uh, 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 Occupy, uh, Occupy Central occurred directly, like overlapping with the space of global capital. So literally sandwiched under the HSBC headquarters. Um, although eventually cleared on a court order that ruled that it was barring public passage, this encampment presaged uh, uh, a, a larger set of protests uh, uh, now several years ago, also called Occupy Central, in which the residents of the city came out in force on the road network and also on the on the pedestrian network to exert a political presence. Um, I, I hope this provides an interesting counterpoint for discussion. I'll end there. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks to our, our panelists for um, some uh, wide-ranging, very uh, interesting combination of, of, of topics. And I, I think that um, you, you've raised uh, some, some interesting uh, topics for further discussion. The, I think across the three presentations, we've kind of addressed the multi-scalar uh, nature of infrastructure moving from the regional to the metropolitan to the localized pedestrian network. And we've also, I think, um, highlighted the uh, kind of uh, potentially social nature of these, how, whether they're um, kind of occupied on an, on an ad hoc everyday basis or if there's a grander kind of civic agenda to them. Um, and just in the kind of interest of time, because we are um, uh, running a bit late, maybe we just open it up to the, the audience. Um, if there are any questions that you'd like to, to start off with uh, for our panelists to discuss, um, we can take those now. Can you discuss the arbitrariness of city planning? <laughs> Regarding sort of like that last question, the last picture that you did, which was the sort of the spontaneous nature of development. Uh, do you like to start, Jonathan? Because you've, you've mentioned um, the kind of like- Just how far behind are we running? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I'll, I'll, what I'd say quickly, um, you know, in response is that um, the, the often discussions of formal versus informal or structured versus arbitrary planning center seems to center around, um, uh, let's say, the, 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 the Chinese condition, which is very much a, a, a top-down, a kind of centrally planned condition um, where the city is designed and built and then occupied versus um, uh, uh, perhaps, let's say, the South Asian or the Latin American condition where um, the, the kind of emergent or the self-structuring exists in, in partnership with the, the, the structured. I, uh, in the Hong Kong example, um, I, everything that I showed was happening within a legal environment, certainly within a regulatory environment. There was nothing, um, um, even even with with the with the with the, uh, uh, the kind of question of where protest falls in that. I think is the only moment where Hong Kong crosses that that edge. 
Um, but there's a tremendous amount of physical infrastructure fabrication in Hong Kong um, that occurs l legally, but occurs not through a kind of a, a grand top-down vision, not through, through master planning. Um, the accrual, literally, of the city's shoreline over many years happened more or less ad hoc. Each layer was kind of planned in sequence. The planning of the, the, the networks of pedestrian infrastructure that I showed, uh, uh, which have, have been growing for 50 years, has occurred not as part of a, uh, a kind of a, a modernist, let's say, vision of the elevated deck organizing all pedestrian movement above the, the, the movement of the automobile, um, but rather as a set of, of individual desires by individual operators, of which the government is one, but of which the, the, the MTR, the, the, the transit company for the subways, is another, of which um, private landholders, private developers are, are a third. Yeah. And that that collaboration produces the, you know, the, the, the results on the ground more than any, any central vision does. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, Pep, you can speak a little bit maybe as to how uh, Barcelona, the Barcelona model might kind of contrast with the, the Hong Kong model, um, it, not, just, not just physically, but maybe in how the, um, how the, the uh, kind of public-private uh, relationship might dif differ from in Hong Kong. Uh, well, well, it seems to me that Barcelona is one a very uh, common city in the world has nothing something very special let me say here uh, sometimes we have some, some some very crucial curious situations like this situation of saying well we don't need metro we we, we have enough with bus because we as a little city we, we don't need to think in such a so we were very impressed when when uh, politicians and some technicals uh, said these kind of things. And then we started to study, because we at the university are doing research also, and we are going, we started the research of the plans of the city. I really realized something very curious. We have been a very long history of plans, public plans from 60s to first 70s, and, we, and someone decided to invent something new that let's say two circle lines uh, just tangent one to the other one as a model of metro, metro, uh, metro plan for the future. And we realized also that this plan was uh, a certain influence of the city. And, and in a way, we, so we, we were interested in things uh, in a way that it's uh, exciting things, but belongs to a city that is a general city. It's a normal city, you know, like, like, no, let's say like uh, 90, 99% of the, and okay, if you are looking uh, Hong Kong or let's say the schemes of Erskine in Manhattan in the last 60s, then you could realize that some very special situations in the world. And it's very nice to know that as uh, something different. But the cities in the world, believe me, are something else different. Thanks. Um, and I, uh, I think I was told I should maybe gather a few questions at, at once, and we can kind of the, we can each answer those as as we wish. Um, and uh, I might throw one of my own into into the mix uh, first. Is um, uh, kind of relating uh, Mirka what you, you've spoken about today, as well as um, Jonathan, something you've written in the past uh, about Boston's own big dig. Uh, kind of criticizing the lack of uh, relationship between the roadway uh, underneath and the greenway above, and that, how that might relate to, to, to Mirko, your discussion of kind of this um, negotiation between the ideas of efficiency versus the kind of civic uh, nature of infrastructure, potentially civic nature of infrastructure, this kind of public quality to it. Um, so if you could maybe, as the first question, maybe could you speak, speak a little bit more as to um, what qualities uh, would you potentially these civic qualities, would you, would you seek in the kind of integration of multiple forms of infrastructure, particularly these, these um, alternatives to, to car infrastructure that we've uh, displayed on, on the wall in the hallway outside? Um, so if, put a pin in that one for a moment, and we'll maybe collect a few more questions from the audience, and then uh, move from there. Are there any questions in the audience?
Uh, hi, I'm just wondering about the like the negative exter externality that this well, uh, the infrastructure also pose because like sometimes uh, new highways can be well, poorly designed and bring well, destroy neighborhoods and and in other cases uh, they actually bring the opposite bring 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 they they actually bring the, the value of the city up so I don't know what are the relationship and in the Barcelona case of policy and, and, and the way that urban designers uh, can pose a, well, I don't know, can put design in this, in this thing and, and, and manage uh, the negative externalities such as uh, gentrification. And I don't know how, how the personal case have managed that. Okay, uh, are there, is there uh, one or two other questions? Um, thank you very much for your lectures. It was very interesting. I guess that my question is more for Jonathan. Um, because we have seen in Hong Kong this very intertwined um, infrastructural network for pedestrians, um, which is very uh, related with the topography and with the density of this specific city. But uh, it also reminds me uh, with the image we saw yesterday, um, the Nolan map of Rome, where we saw also this um, relationship between interior and exterior spaces, but more uh, in a flat way and not in this sectional, very interesting way that uh, Hong Kong has done. So my question will be, how can you translate these strategies as a model, or how you can transplant these strategies into other cities that are not that, that doesn't have these particular um, characteristics as Hong Kong? Um. So we have one, one more, maybe, and then we'll move to discussion. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you, I mean, uh, I think there's some kind of uh, need for hyper-accessibility and uh, like uh, an even spread of infrastructure in the cities. And I wonder how does this work across different scales? And uh, we, we talked about scaling down also the infrastructure to, uh, to incorporate pedestrian systems. Uh, I mean, is there, a, is there a contradiction? How does this work in different scales? And uh, is, it, is there a pattern, or is it like a city-specific case? OK. Um, do we want to just jump in, or, um, or I can kind of maybe collect those thoughts? Go ahead. About the infrastructure, I would like to, to remark that uh, if we have to build an infra, a, a huge infrastructure in a segregated way, you have to think that uh, you can create uh, an, a scenario for uh, an improving of the neighborhoods that uh, uh, that um, behind that, at, uh, and that uh, that was the, the point where uh, the criticisms for for the neighborhoods and and the the functional uh, uh, the needs of, for, for the function of the of our city was was uh, was in the point. And in the agreement and trying to produce a project, so uh, it, it's it's possible. We have not to think the infrastructure and something that is against the pedestrian. Let me see about the pedestrian. Pedestrian will be, in a way, the central of our uh, thinking about uh, urban design because from the pedestrians you could take and plane. Uh, from the pedestrian you can take an uh, railway station. From the pedestrian. All things happen from the pedestrians. So that's why the, the paradox, in a way, is thinking pedestrian is a way of thinking about the streets, is a way of thinking about a massive transport. All mobility has the central point about thinking of how the pedestrians uh, works. That's why the most advanced countries and cities are that ones uh, where the distance between uh, one mode to another mode, when you're going from tram to bicycle, from tram to metro, from metro to uh, to airport, uh, are uh, just a, f a small and very comfortable um, uh, travels, little, little, little okay, uh, spaces. In a way, this is why I am very impressed because of um, uh, Hong Kong and the cities that made possible the pedestrian in the center of of the way of living in the city. Um, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that the, to address the question about, about um, the uh, 
kind of where the Hong Kong model goes. I think your reference to Noli is is um, um, is just terrific. I think that the the thing that that the, the, that the Noli map does is it provides through the act of drawing it provides a um, let's say a kind of an emancipatory uh, uh, infrastructure for the pedestrian to occupy the city the spaces of the city the diverse spaces of the city as a continuity um, in retrospect, I don't know if the Noli plan had this effect at the time, but it certainly, it allows us to see the city in a way that we would not otherwise if we drew it differently. And um, so I, I don't think that the dense three-dimensional network of Hong Kong necessarily transmits really anywhere, um, much less um, you know, to Barcelona. But in both cases, I would note, drawings had to be made. I mean, the fact that you had to make this um, kind of a, 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 a atlas of the, of the cosmology of uh, the, the city's subway system in order to demonstrate to the population the, the value and even the urgency of its extension speaks to the value of looking at and drawing cities um, in order to learn how to occupy them um, as a continuity, as a public, as a kind of continuous public space, publicly occupiable space. I, I just quickly, I'll jump on your comment about, about the big dig. I mean, in fact, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the title of that piece of writing, which no one was supposed to be able to find 15 years after it was written is why Boston is bad. And the argument was that there's just a crushing lack of the sublime taken into consideration in the planning of the big dig. Um, I, I think that today's keynote sets up precisely um, the opposite and kind of correct uh, a, a, a approach, right? Which is to integrate the experience of being on the automobile with the experience of being in the city and vice versa in ways that take advantage of section, in ways that take advantage of differences in speed or, 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 or ways in which the city is seen as a pedestrian or, or in a car. Um, given that we're not gonna do the big dig again, what might work as an alternative would be to make a drawing, make a really compelling and, and like substantial set of drawings that describe to the people of Boston what the big dig is and where they are in it. Uh, that might have a uh, a kind of a freeing effect on on our ability to like grasp its tremendousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and maybe um, I mean, Pep, you've touched on this with the the the, cent the, cent the kind of contemporary centrality of the pedestrian and infrastructural development. Um, but I think we with what what Jonathan's saying with the big dig is that uh, maybe that I mean the car is still a, very much an important part of the infrastructure. And then how do we um, how do we then kind of integrate and balance those two? And maybe this goes, Mirko, to your your discussion of um, the kind of potentially civic quality and of infrastructure. What 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 qualities are are um, makes infrastructure have that take on a kind of public or or, or civic uh, uh, um, quality? And uh, maybe then we can also come back around to these ideas of um, of uh, the the social impact of infrastructure. Um. I think that it could be nice to increase the level of complexity. <clears throat> so we are speaking of efficiency of infrastructure and public role of infrastructure, civic role of infrastructures. I would like to go back to a point that uh, I think from, from a political point of view, today you, start, you have to, to add to these uh, components the environmental component. And it's impossible to do anything today if you do not address this issue, which is a very interesting point because it's a way to address taking advantage of a discussion and a sensibility, a lot of other issues like social inequalities. Uh, it's not something new that I'm saying. But I'm saying that, uh, and some of examples, for example, the social housing in New York related to the environmental transformation related to the Katrina effect and these kind of things, are just explaining these kind of things. So I feel that uh, it's not uh, to make an infrastructure also uh, um, participate into the construction of a public space. We have plenty of examples, and again, I'm happy Barcelona to be here, but Hong Kong is the same thing in a different way. So I am saying that from a strategic point of view, 
uh, um, we have uh, to uh, add uh, this component and to start, in my opinion, from this component. And uh, we have to acknowledge uh, one uh, thing that uh, perhaps uh, from a disciplinary point of view, we never acknowledge uh, properly that uh, the society and the urban environment that reflects that is a conflictual environment. And uh, planners, urban designers, architects, they are not giving any solution to anything. They are part of the conflict. So they are taking position inside the conflict in one way or in another way. Which means that, in my opinion, to be effective today, you have at least to understand which position you are taking. It's not anymore the idea of, you know, regional planning or strategic planning. You have a kind of technocratic idea to decide what is. No. And in respect to the problem of the highway, you can decide that you are against the construction of highway. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, mo I'm exaggerating, of course, it's not, but anyway, there is a kind of taking position. The neutrality does not exist, has never existed. So in this respect, especially to this kind of discussion, I feel that the first thing that we have to do to acknowledge our position in this discussion and in this conflictual situation where do we position ourselves? And to make that very clear, then we can contribute to a certain solution or to other solutions. But there is never a good solution by itself. Any solution is the result of a, a conflictual political social situation in which you are part and you are part of the problem. Pretend that we solve problems is totally, you know, the most uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, the worst uh, uh, heritage of uh, uh, modern architecture. We are never solving any problem. We are only moving the problem to another level, to another point, to another discussion. Uh, and maybe I, uh, I would like to, to, to add something uh, at those words of, of Miguel, of course, uh, I agree, but um, let me say, we discovered, for instance, that part of uh, our problems as professionals, as, as uh, people interested in cities, are also discussed in the frontiers of our works. I mean, when we talk about metro, from the point of view of designing what will be the future, we were linking with, let's say, uh, civil engineers and people that were thinking of, let's say we have made geographers, for instance, we have made a lot of studies about, uh, about people coming from here, going there, and, and uh, the public transport uh, needs to uh, solve uh, what the demand, uh, what, what the people is, is demanding. No? And we realized that uh, in a way, something so serious, so expensive, like, like decide metro lines, is something that links with urbanism and links with things that we know because he's thinking about the city and his deeper structure. Uh, that's why, in a way, metro is a sort of a structure that's on the, underneath. You mean, in a way, has able to produce uh, uh, an and, and another view of what the city uh, what the city is, and that seems to me that, of course, we, we have uh, problems of environmental and so on. But we have to be uh, uh, um, uh, we have to be very conscious of our responsibility as the people. Who, in a way, uh, Joan Busquets said yesterday, uh, we are able to think and to, we are able to to see the, the, the general image, the image, the former urbis of the city. So if it's that, then you are able to imagine the future of that. And that is a very specific question on architecture. Indeed, in the frontier of, of knowledge, but it's in our aim. And I will introduce you, and I will uh, give you the opportunity to add to our, to add to our research on that. It seems that in Harvard you have very clever in many things, and on that you could uh, help us also to go ahead on these kind of things in our research center coming from 60s. That is uh, an opportunity for the dean and so on. Thank you.
I think uh, I think we'll we'll end, uh, end there. Um, I th uh, thanks to our panelists again. I think that we've um, raised some uh, uh, important issues that can continue to be discussed, uh, perhaps during this coffee break, um, on the the necessarily multi-scalar nature of infrastructure, its ecological uh, con uh, implications, as well as um, uh, yeah. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs>